If I told you that all you had to do to save a species from disaster was put a birdhouse up in your backyard, would you do it? One of the first stories that I heard after starting my job at the Purple Martin Conservation Association was of a man who waited for his wife to go shopping for the day. And while she was gone, he cut down her favorite tree to make room for a Purple Martin house. I thought, what did I just get myself into? Who are these people? Uh, it wasn't long before I uncovered this group of people who call themselves Purple Martin landlords. They're willing to do amazing things for their birds. They make nests for them when they're coming back from their spring migration. They hand feed them when the weather's bad and food gets scarce. They protect them from other birds who would do them harm. And yes, some of them will even cut down their wife's favorite tree while she is at the store. Um, Purple Martin stewardship is something that's passed down from generation to generation. Purple Martins exhibit something called site fidelity, which means year after year they'll come back to the same place as long as they were successful in breeding the previous year. To understand the landlords that take care of these Purple Martins, you first have to understand Purple Martins themselves. Purple Martins are America's largest swallow species. The males are the bright purple ones with the flashy colors. The females have the creamier color and purple highlights. Uh, they're what's called secondary cavity nesters, which means they like to build their nests in holes, but they don't make the holes themselves. They're aerial insectivores, which means that they eat only flying insects. Uh, a conservative estimate is that they eat 262 billion insects every year. That's billion with a B. They're an integral part of our ecosystem. They migrate south to the tropics every winter. These birds actually uh, will overwinter in the Amazon rainforest. That's a 10,000 mile round trip every year. When they're preparing for this migration, they form huge flocks called roosts, numbering in the hundreds of thousands. We're actually home to such a roost here in Erie, Pennsylvania at the head of the bay. That's where that picture is from. Uh, it's truly a natural wonder. I, I, we're very lucky to have it. I, I hope you get a chance to see it someday. Those roosts are actually so big that they'll show up on weather radar uh, in the morning when they leave the, net, the roost as an exploding circle as they, as they disperse. At some point before European settlement, purple martins and humans forged a bond. They, the Native Americans began to hang hollowed out gourds up in their villages and the purple martins began to nest them. We don't know why, we don't know when it began, but it, you know, maybe it was because they ate uh, pests of their crops. Maybe it was the, uh, maybe they acted as a scarecrow or a watchdog. Um, maybe, maybe they just appreciated their, the aesthetic beauty of them, their flight, their song, their color. Um, whatever the reason, a strong uh, association with human habitation began and continues to this day. European settlers came along and uh, quickly adopted that technique of Purple Martin uh, husbandry. They preferred, though, to hang up uh, wooden houses that are more uh, human-like. Uh, they quickly spread all across uh, the country, and uh, John James Audubon is actually quoted as saying that, uh, I've noticed that every country tavern has a Purple Martin house, and the nicer the house, uh, the better does the inn tend to be. Life was good for Purple Martins. They had the best of both worlds. They nested in nature. They nested in human-provided housing. Things were great, but it wasn't to last. In 1850, groups across the nation began uh, to release English house sparrows, an invasive species, to their communities in an effort to establish them, get a little taste of home. Well, those birds quickly spread throughout the United States. 
quickly, by uh, 30 years later, groups began to form with the goal of eradication of these birds. In 1890, a group called the American Acclimatization Society uh, in New York City set forth with the goal to establish all of the birds in the works of William Shakespeare to North America. One of them was this European starling. Well, that one too quickly spread, and those invasive species now number in the hundreds of millions. The problem with purple martins, the problem for purple martins is that those two invasive species also like to nest in the same cavities that they do, and they're way more tenacious in their efforts to do so. Uh, the end result of pressure from those invasive species and habitat loss from deforestation is that today purple martins are completely reliant on uh, humans for providing nesting sites. They don't nest in nature east of the Rocky Mountains anymore. They're unable to. The Purple Martin Conservation Association is working hard to help. We're targeting a new generation of landlords with education because without new landlords, this species fate is sealed. We're determining best management practices through scientific research and preaching that to both new and established uh, generations. Uh, since 1966, purple martins have decreased in Pennsylvania almost 3% every year. That's every year. That's the equivalent loss of three quarters of all purple martins in Pennsylvania during that time. Range-wide, it's almost 1%. And that's the equivalent loss of about a third of purple martins. The situation is dire. Looking back now, I understand those people who shocked me upon entry into this field. They do, they do what they do because they understand the reliance of this bird on humans and that there aren't enough people helping. It's people who make the difference. I've become one of them. I actually, this year, I removed one of my favorite trees to make room for a purple martin house. I did leave my wife's favorite tree up, however. <laughs> I hope that whatever you can do, you choose to help us in this fight to save this species and its slide from extinction. Thank you.